Let's just uh, a brief, a brief review of where we've been. The first week we were together, we talked extensively about the purpose of the local church and God's eternal plan. We're here, you remember the circles I put on the board, God's love for the people in your world, in the community where you are, and there's those people over here, and we, we looked at the cross, and we looked at the in, inspired word, what part that plays in God's eternal plan, but where do you fit into God's eternal plan as individuals, especially as evangelists, where do you fit into that plan as a body of people as you go out and begin to work with the church? Where does that body of people, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ in that community, they are God's messengers, ambassadors. They are God's mouthpiece to that community. They're his hands and his feet to go out and serve that community. And uh, when we get back from break, we're going to do a, a brainstorming session. Uh, this is fun. I love to do this with a congregation to... Uh, to come up with fresh ideas. Uh, how can we serve people with the ultimate plan that we're going to use that, those acts of kindness, those acts of service, the showing people that we care about them to open up the doors, not just, you know, just to, for uh, a moment, but begin to see ourselves as servants for whom Christ wanted us to be, to, to reach out to people so that we can study God's word with them and that they too might be a part of the kingdom. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5, a very important verse. Paul said, speaking, I believe, of the apostles, but also more uh, broadly of the, of the Lord's church, what we preach, what we proclaim, in other words, what we, what we say, what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. I think if I had to find one verse that talks about the purpose of the Lord's church, it's not to go out and just proclaim, here's who we are, here's what we believe, here's what we don't believe, but to live out the likeness of Jesus and say to the community with our lips, we're, and by our actions, Jesus Christ is Lord. We want to talk to you. We want to proclaim him to you. And we want to serve you. We see ourselves as his servants to you. And so we're going to serve you in his name so that we might do that, so we might proclaim Jesus to you. I see that as a, as a pretty clear statement, I think, that kind of summarizes what's the purpose of the Lord's church. It's to go and make disciples of all nations. It's to preach the gospel to everybody. And our acts of kindness, our acts of service is a way to get the door open. But uh, just being kind to somebody else and say, well, if I hang around them long enough and do enough kind things, they'll get the idea. People do not surrender their life to Jesus by osmosis. Just by hanging around people that, that act like him. And that's a good door opener. It's, it's definitely evidence that you can be trusted. But at some point, you as the evangelist and those members of the congregation need to be willing to say, I have some good news I want to share with you about Jesus, whom I'm trying to imitate, who, I'm, who I, am a disciple, I am a disciple of his. Any questions about lesson one, about as we went on to discuss, using Jesus as an example with the woman at the well, um, how he segued a conversation from physical water to spiritual water, how he brought up spiritual things. She had questions that led to a further discussion. We need to get discussions started with people in the marketplace. And then don't be afraid to ask for the Bible study. Ask for the opportunity to sit down, them bringing their copy of God's Word, you bringing yours, and starting with, and then lesson two, starting with what we talked about last week, that overview. Yes, sir. And how does this happen in inner city America? How does that happen in where, inner city America? Where at each corner you can buy two beers for one buck. Can you really? Yes, you oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get the no. I just <laughs> it is tragic. Um, Satan's out there. He's the enemy, as I talked about in chapel yesterday morning. He, we're waging war. It's not a, a, a battle against flesh and blood. It's against... Uh, Spiritual darkness in, in the world is, has been captured 
by him. How do we bring them back to life once they experience spiritual death? One way is to serve them, get their attention. Uh, another way is to pray. Obviously, the place to start is to pray for them by name as you begin to meet them and learn what their name is or find out what they do and, and begin to work your way into their life. Pray for them. Ask God to get their attention, but also to open the eyes of your heart that you see the opportunity. So the place to start, as Jesus said, first have compassion for them and then pray. Uh, and then take advantage of the open door and go and begin that conversation. See if there's any interest at all. If not, keep praying. Keep serving them. Does that help? It's got to start somewhere. Got to go out on the plane ride home thinking about it. Okay. <laughs> okay. In my community. And while you're on the pl plane on the way home. Oh, I'll get somebody. I, I was going to say, while you're on the way yeah. home thinking about this. Don't be afraid to start the conversation with the person in the seat next oh, to you. Oh, absolutely. Okay. That's practice. All right. <laughs> now, they might say, I don't want to talk about it. Well, okay, you haven't had enough time to pray for them very much. Okay. Great. Now, some of you might not oh, be, yeah, I might not be, a, uh, feel equipped to go out into the place where sin is prevalent. You might not yet feel equipped. Ask God to help you to see where you can best serve. But there's somebody's got to go. Jesus went to where the sinners were and uh, met them where they were and brought them out of that. There's a lot of different methods, and, and there are a lot of safer places to start. I went and got my hair cut Monday. I walked into uh, one of these pro-cut places uh, where unless you state who you want, you get whoever's available to do the one, the one that's going to do the cutting. That takes faith, man. Okay. And um, I, I, I had this lady named Betty that, was, that I was assigned to and we'll sit in her chair and she's going to cut my hair. Well, I wasn't sitting in the chair very long, and she could tell somehow, I guess by my accent or the lack thereof, that I was not from around here. Y'all ain't from around here, are you? <laughs> what are you doing here? Glad you asked. I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. It didn't take very long. We were beginning to talk about why I was here in town, and so the conversation obviously turned to the idea about having a relationship with God and I'd love to talk to her more about that. And she began to talk to me a little bit about where she attended on occasions. But she immediately switched the conversation to her mother. She said, my mom's gone totally nuts about this. I said, explain to me what you mean. She said, well, her mother, my grandmother, lived in a nursing home out in Littlefield. My mom lives here in Lubbock. But there was a, a preacher from the Church of Christ out in Littlefield that came every Sunday to hold services and to teach the Bible to uh, these elderly folks in the nursing home where my grandmother was, and my grandmother attended that. She said on Sunday my mom would travel out there uh, to see her mother and would attend this service with her. And she was so grateful for this man taking his time an effort to come there and care for, spiritually show care and concern for her mother, that after her mother was gone, long since gone from this earth, she continued to drive from Lubbock to Littlefield to listen to this man who she found out cared so much for the souls of people and surrendered her life to Jesus as now a part of the Littlefield Church. I said, man, i got to share that with the class. What an awesome method of evangelism. Show people you care. Make the effort to get outside of your comfort zone or outside of your 
your lazy factor, go ahead and take the effort, make the effort to show that you are concern, concerned about the souls of people. Even go to nursing homes. And a lot of times those people in the nursing homes, many, many of them can't even fully comprehend what you're saying, but it's their, the next generation and maybe generation or two uh, that really might respond to the kindness and uh, care that you show about spiritual well-beings of their, of their elder, elderly relatives, generations before them. So in that particular case, maybe a safer, a safer method than going right down to the crack house. Or, but the inner city is a tough place. It's one of the places that somebody has to go. Is there anybody else in the flock that's better prepared to go there than you? Somebody has to go. Was Anita and then over here. Great. What, a, what an awesome opening of the door. Beginning of a new relationship. We can see Jesus doing it. We can see the apostles doing it. Paul walking into a town and being so willing to go to uh, the Acropolis area there on Mars Hill and proclaim the gospel, but to personally start by saying to them, I see you're very religious. Start on common ground, but then address the issue. You're worshiping this God as an unknown God. Let me tell you about him. And some, he goes on to say, not all, but some said, we want to hear more about this. And of course, he told them more about it. They had to start somewhere. Our willingness to go to people who for decades have studied a certain way under certain leaders. And now you're there in the, in the senior, senior last minute often of their life helping them to better understand and to look forward to, by faith in Christ Jesus, what God's promises are. Help them to more clearly understand it. And it not only says that to them, but to generations who love them, their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. Here. I come from an area where a lot of my friends and even some of my family have been like, this is like uh, mess and stuff. Okay. One of the things I think it's also worth pointing out is, and you feel free to say, I'm not out of line or whatnot, you know. Um, but I think we also need to be uh, not in the places where we're going to get ourselves out of some trouble. As far as I go on, if you have a problem with, you know, Matt, don't go to Matt's house to preach to people. If you have a problem with pornography, don't go to Hugh Hatcher's house to preach to people. You know? Good point. You can meet him at other places right. at other times. Uh, but don't put yourself uh, in the den if you can catch him outside of the den on their catch them uh, i'm a hunter you know i don't always go to where the deer bed or where they feed but i i know the travel route and i try to ambush them okay <laughs> uh be as wise as what is this wise as serpents as harmless as a dove but be be there where you can where you can uh, capture their attention uh, and serve them and teach them the truth about Jesus. Well, let's, uh, let's briefly overview besides just how do we get that study, how do we, how do we penetrate the inner city, how do we, how do we find the time and, and maybe even convert the elderly or at least their loved ones. Uh, many methods of getting the conversation, getting the Bible study. Last time we were together, I did a brief overview. I, I said 20 minutes. It might take you 25, but I wouldn't take any longer than that. Um, I did that rather quickly last time. Do you need to see that again, or do you think you'd have a pretty good grip of it? How many would like to just see me do that one more time? Okay, good. You got a, uh, got a pretty good grip of it. It's in lesson two, okay? What? Oh, yeah, yeah. You want to you see it a second time? Okay. Um, before the day's over, 
I want you to do that again. I guess if I, instead of giving a midterm, oh boy, that, that got your attention now, didn't it? Eh? Uh, I want to see you do that with somebody, okay? I'm still contemplating whether we're going to do that here, or, but I want you to do that before the day's over, okay? I want your word that you will. It could be with somebody else in this class. It, it could be to contact somebody on your 10 most wanted list before the day's over. But you have an assignment before the day's over to do a brief overview with someone. Uh, if you do it with somebody else in the class, I want them to give you a grade for that. Okay? So we're going to talk more about that as the day goes on. But that's where I always start, remembering this. Here's some benefits of starting with an overview. It gives the big picture. God loves you, Calvary worth. He loves you so much that he sent his son. It helps him to see the big picture so that any other questions that you will answer in that first study or find answers in the word for them, it comes in the context of this message of God's love. Secondly, uh, it shows them that God has a plan, and he's working his plan on your behalf. He's, he's not out of control. He didn't wind this earth up and let it go and then come back someday to check on it. He's involved in the hearts and the lives of people, and he has a plan for you. And there's a place for you in his plan. It helps you see where they are by the questions that they ask, and the comments that they make as you go along. Don't be afraid to be taking some notes and writing down the questions that they ask as you do the overview. As you do an overview of the scriptures in 20 to 25 minutes, it's going to raise more questions maybe in their minds and hearts than it will answer. But at the same time, I have, said, I have had said to me by many, many people of the thousands that I've done that with, many of them have made a remark Something like this. I've learned more about the Bible in the last 20 minutes than I have in my whole life up till now. I never knew that it told one story like this. It helps you to see where they are in their understanding by the questions they ask. It creates common ground upon which to go to the places where you do have differences in understanding. It raises their interest level in studying God's Word. It helps them to become more familiar and a desire to know better what the Bible is. It's a library, not just a book. It gives much evidence as to how we can know that the Bible is the inspired word of God as it claims to be, not just written by men. It's how we know that the Bible is God's word. Any questions or thoughts about why I start with an overview? Now, let me reiterate, re-emphasize. You don't have to do it just exactly the way that I did. I don't do it exactly the same way every time, depending on the questions that are asked and where I put the emphasis, but I want the emphasis to be on Jesus as the complete fulfillment of the law and the prophets, as he said in Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 5. As he did with the people on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. He is the fulfillment of the old covenant the law and the prophets and the Psalms and Moses and the prophets spoke of him and he showed them where that was so. I want the emphasis to be on Jesus. The Son of God, crucified, his atoning sacrifice. It's what it's all about. And how do we respond to a God that loves us that much? That's where I'm going with this study. I don't want to lose focus of that. I want them to get the picture of where we've been and why we're doing what we're doing and where we're going. It's all about a relationship that God desires to have with them, so much so that he sent his son. I believe the overview is the place to start with that. Any questions about that? 
Okay, lesson two in my material, his eternal plan will help you to go back over that and to review that and to better understand it and be more ready to use it. I would hope that sometime during this research week, this break week, you will do that a time or two. And don't forget to let me know about it. Okay? With a card. With who it was, how you got this opportunity to do that, and uh, what you thought was covered and the, what result there was. Just briefly stated, because I want it all on one card. All right? Questions about that? Let me talk just a minute about, about the book. We haven't gone to it before today. We're going to go to it a little bit more today. Um, it's just a collection of material that I found out works by trial and error with thousands of Bible studies over decades. I found out this, this is pretty much the kinds of stuff that, that I found that people need to know from studying the scriptures. This is uh, a way. It's not the only way. There's Fishers of Men, there's uh, Jewel Miller Film Strips, there's, uh, oh man, I could go on and on. John Hurt's uh, Bible Correspondence Courses, the World Bible Study Courses. Uh, there's a number of pieces of material. This is just man-written material, but it helps to put the scriptures in some order that I think makes sense. Look at all the methods that are out there. Adopt your own. Adapt to others' material to your own. Uh, but whatever you do, make sure it's the truth. But this material starts with, how do we know there is a God? I, I talk about three pillars, as if, you, if you've gotten into the book. Three pillars. If, you've got, if you have a three-legged school, a stool, a three-legged uh, bench, bench or stool, you know what happens if you cut off one leg. What happens? It's going over, man. It just don't stand. I believe there's three pillars upon which Christianity rests. One is the fact that there is a God. The other, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the third is that the Bible is the Word of God, not necessarily in that order. I believe the understanding that there is a God, that the Bible is His Word. Now, what does the Bible say about Jesus and what He did and who He is and the authority that He has? And so those three have to exist. And I took it in that order. Lesson one in this material... What is, at least briefly speaking, just kind of hitting the surface of the thing? I recommend other books, and some are available are on the website. How do we know that there is a God? What evidence is there? What evidence is there for the Bible's claim to be the inspired word of God? As the writers wrote, what, what evidence is there? And I believe that overview provides a lot of evidence. Because it's different writers that never met together, never lived at the same time, never spoke the same language tell different parts of the same story. I believe that's evidence. It helped to convince me. And the third place is in lesson three in this book, and that is, how do we know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Now, I'm not going to take time here in class to discuss that, because many of the other lessons that you have learned here, especially Ed Wharton's material evidence, Christian evidences, talk about the secular writers, lesson three, page 22 in the book. It talks about the fulfillment of prophecy his material does, and you've been through that. It talks about that uh, he is God with us, and the eyewitnesses who heard him say it, and the evidence that was provided by his life, the eyewitnesses were convinced. We listen to Jesus' own personal claims that he is the Son of God. We look at the miracles that he worked, verse 29. We look at the greatest miracle, the one that he said would be the evidence, his resurrection from the dead and that the resurrection is proof of his claim. And then as that's summarized in the conclusion on page 31, we'll not go to any more detail on that material, but first of all, the study that we have to have with people, do or do they not believe that there is a God? Don't move on to the material that's in lesson two until you have looked at the evidences, if they're agnostic or if they're an atheist, share that with them. They might not want to go on, but if they do want to go on, then discuss with them what evidence there is that the Bible is the Word of God. Once they at least have heard that and have come to some conclusion about what they believe about this collection of historically ins and inspired material, now it's time to go, once they're convinced, this might take one lesson, it might take 
weeks, it might take months. I remember one particular fellow I studied with, it took years. It was for seven years I studied with him. He said verbally that he was an atheist the first week we determined that he was more of an agnostic. He didn't know. But he didn't believe that there was a God. We, it took seven years before he was immersed into Christ Jesus. First it took, we met once a month, one night a month, because he heard his children praying for him night after night after night, and he realized that he needed to get some information. And so we began to study one night a month. For seven years, we studied one night a month. It's a marathon. It's going to take some time. But once he was convinced that there was a God, we then moved on to the material that the Bible was the Word of God, and finally we got to the evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. This material in Lesson 3 is what we discussed there. Somebody had their hand up. Yes? Yeah, once, once we have a Bible study, whether it takes one or ten, uh, is our ultimate goal to bring them to the Church of Christ? Our ultimate goal is to bring them to Jesus, to a full understanding that there is a God, that the Bible is the Word of God, and that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, we're going to bring them... What's the, are we promoting the Church of Christ? I'm promoting... What we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. But how can we bring them to the head? How can we bring them to the head of the church unless at the same time we're at least bringing them to some understanding of what the body of Christ is all about? How can we bring them to the head without... What are we, will we practice an amputation here? We can't separate the head from the body. We definitely are going to be talking to them about the church. So, but I don't, think, I don't think in the scriptures, the examples we have, they're what we're commissioned to do is to go out there and begin by talking about us. We need to first get them to realize who Jesus is and then begin to talk to them about how to be a part of this plan and be added to his body. It's a bigger Bible study eventually? It's going to be. Well, sometimes we'll bring them into a group, but a lot of people don't like to ask their personal questions in the group, especially if they've had a bad religious I'm experience. I'm talking about in the sense of worship is... is do we bring them, are we ultimately bringing them to where we worship? Well, I, I think along the way, they're going to want to begin to learn more about why we go there, and it's to be encouraged and uplifted and build up and to be matured. And, and uh, it's pretty hard for an unborn to begin to swallow and understand the teachings that's being given to the reborn. You, you understand what I'm saying? So we need to make sure their questions are being answered but, uh, yeah, I'm beginning now as they show interest and uh, are convinced that the Bible is the word of God and that Jesus is the son of God, uh, to begin to come and see these worshipers, these people that are celebrating their relationship and remember what he did. But they begin to see that. And often that will cause them to want to learn more because they see this love that they have for one another. How are they going to know that you're his disciples? By the, your love for one another. How are they going to know? What proves that you are his disciples when they see the fruit that you bear? So they need to see the body, and they need to understand, and many times their questions will begin to turn to, well, why do you worship as you do, or why do you do this, or why don't you do that? But the emphasis remains, and you need a relationship with God. He'll add you to his body. But don't, don't run from or shy away from those questions about the body. Okay? They, they will be answered but first, they need to understand that the Bible is the Word of God and that Jesus is the Son of God. And how do we stop that confusion of, running, of them running to a denomination? Boy, that's a good question. How do we keep them from being confused by running back maybe to... Straight to the Baptist. Or yeah, straight some to other denomination. Yeah. Yeah. At I'll, some point, we're going to have to discuss that with them, and hopefully we, we get that in there before they start running, okay? <laughs> but uh, if they can be convinced that you care about them and that you're on this journey together... They're not going to jump off the path on this journey if you're really loving them, nurturing them, and teaching them, okay? Not that I haven't certainly had the experience of losing some. Yes, sir, Kevin? I was going to say, um, one thing that sometimes you maybe uh, studying with somebody who's living in a different area, like if we're living up in the Hill Center, of course, like in the garage, they're not going to, you know, studying with somebody here in Lubbock, Sure. The body of believers and, and uh, one of the good biblical teachings. I, I know some churches out in this area. 
Jewish. But isn't the Church of Christ a denomination? Is the Church of Christ a denomination? Okay. See, now that's where they're coming from. That's the way they yeah. viewed it. Somewhere, that has to be clarified. Okay, is the Church of that for you, those of you who can't hear him maybe, he asked, is the Church of Christ a denomination? That's where they're coming from. That's why you need to go there. You can't leave that kind of concept in their thinking. But at the same time, don't leave the major subject, and that is, what is the Bible? Who is Jesus? Have you a relationship with God through faith in him? Have you surrendered your life to him? In the course of study here, after we've discussed those things, then we begin to talk about faithfulness, the recipe for faithfulness, lesson eight in this material, lesson nine about the changed life, lesson 10 about the local church and why you need to be a part of the church in your location, not driving all the way up to Hale Center to find it, but where's the church in your location and how to identify it and, and so on, okay? That material's in here. You might choose to teach that in a different order, but I think their understanding of who Jesus is and what he did, his atoning sacrifice, what he's done about this broken relationship because of sin, and how did you taken that in and responded to it, do you personally have a relationship with God that's a saved relationship, not broken because of sin? What did he add you to, or what does he add you to, and how do you remain faithful, and how do you worship him as a, as a born-again child of God, believer, a worshiper of God. How do you worship? That's the order that I put it in, chose to put it in in this material. It's also the order that I choose to put it in when I'm studying with somebody, unless their questions cause me to put that same information in some other order, okay? Okay. Whenever you have someone who is really searching for truth, mm -hmm. they have a tendency to find it. Um, and, and if they do run off to that church or not, they have to go to the I mean, if they have a real hunger to know God, a lot of times those studies are going to go out of it. Um, they talk about okay. Catholic people, you know, they just don't know enough. Go home straight to the end of the world, really, the way you say, really start. For those of you that are a little further away from the microphone maybe and can't hear that, he said the place that we really needed to go is to help ignite within them a passion for the truth and a relationship with God that satisfies God and this passion that they have. And that's what will keep them from running off. But if they do begin to go somewhere else, uh, it's time for us to go ahead and, uh, and help them to understand what does the Bible say? Otherwise, if all we do is go out there and preach ourselves and who we understand that we are, what God says that we are, too often it's misunderstood where all we're trying to do is to convert them from one denomination to what they see as another denomination. And we're going to discuss that even more after you come back from break week and as we get on down to the material uh, that's in uh, lessons 8, 9, and 10. Yes, sir. My study, my journey, the second most important thing for me in my study and inventory of the New Testament is the places the New Testament where God, or the Spirit, specifically says you won't be part of the human that deals with the issue of how we live our lives. I think I've spent too much of my life worried about worship, not enough worried about my life. Okay. Okay. Well, that's an important point. Uh, the restoration movement, not that there was uh, a, a wrong idea or a wrong concept, but somehow over the decades, over the, the century that we've been involved in this, a century and a half, this thing of restoring Christianity as we see it, we've put all of our emphasis, not all, we've put most of our emphasis on what takes place, restoring what Christians did when they gather together on the first day of the week. 
we put most of our emphasis on something that the Bible says precious little. I believe 1 Corinthians 14 gives us more information than all the rest of the scriptures put together. That they came together for mutual edification and upbuilding and encouragement. There is no place. I know this is really tough. It was so tough for me to swallow. It took months and years for me to be able to admit that there is no place. You help me here. There is no place in the New Testament that refers to the assembly of the saints as this is their worship. Now, they're worshipers, and when worshipers come together, certainly worship is going to take place. Praise, adoration, the, the proskuneo, the bowing down and humbling ourselves before. That's going to take place because there are worshipers that are coming together to mutually upbuild and encourage and instruct each other, to strengthen each other. It's our training camp. It's our locker room. But we're worshipers of God when we go out of there to the workplace and the marketplace and the places of education and serving people. This is our spiritual worship. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It's our changed lives, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's what needs to be restored. I heard one particular preacher say that he happened to get into a discussion with people from some churches that practice what they call holiness. What? The idea of not just Many of them have become more charismatic and Pentecostal than we are. But they ask him specifically, what's your doctrine on holiness? What's the Church of Christ's doctrine on holiness? And he thought for a minute, and this blank stare came over his face. And we realize, if we stop and think about it, we don't very clearly state a doctrine, a teaching, what do we teach about living out this holy nature, this redeemed, reconciled, blood-bought relationship? How do we live it out? How do we help to bring to maturity this holy nature, this way that God sees us through the blood of Jesus? What's our teaching about 24 hours a day, seven days a week, living out holiness? And we've We've pitifully fallen short on that. Does that help? Okay. That's what you need to lead flocks of people that you will work with, congregations all across the country and all around the world. That's where your challenge will be, bringing them, bringing lost people to Christ and then helping to mature those that are in Christ to live godly lives every day. Yes, to do the biblical things that God wants as we come together, and the major thing being that it's edifying and encouraging, celebrative, that will help you to go out and live a joy-filled, excited life for Christ all week long. Having remembered what he did on the cross as you break bread together. And that the songs that you sing will teach and encourage and build up one another. Instruct one another, as the scriptures say. And that the lessons and the teachings that you receive, good thing to do, use Haley's Bible Handbook. Go back and see the quote, not from an inspired man, but a man named Justin Martyr, who wrote about 115, 119, somewhere in there, about early 2nd century, just capsule form, one paragraph, how did outsiders see the assembly of Christians beginning to gather together. It's an absolutely awesome. Any on your computer have a have Bible Haley's Bible Handbook in there after the break, if you wouldn't mind reading what it says. Uh, a quote from Justin Martyr about early second century worshipers and what they did. Pull it up during the break and and read it back to us. But if not, go look it up in the library. It's a brief, very awesome. I'll try to at least come to the essence of it if nobody has it. Other thoughts before we take a break, and we're going to come back and look at what else, what's another lesson that we can teach that will help them to come to some realization of this important question in light of the fact that there is a God that loves me and wants me to spend eternity with him. And in light of the fact 
that there's plenty of evidence that the Bible is the Word of God and that Jesus is the Son of God. In light of those three major pillars, those mighty facts, what is my personal relationship with this God that loves me? It's either broken because of sin or reconciled through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what we're going to study when we come back from the break until we break again.